Hello and welcome to this session of Kirloskar Vasundhara Film Festival. I hope you are all safe and healthy and at home. Today we have a very interesting discussion lined up with two experts who will take us through understanding of ecology, biodiversity and their relationship to human health. The International Union of Geological Sciences terms the current period on Earth as the Holocene. However, it is also called as the Anthropocene, which reflects the dominance of the Homo sapiens on the planet. Even as technology has given us a comfortable and more secure lifestyle, the consequences of this lifestyle on nature have largely remained ignored. The decline in biodiversity and the degradation of ecosystems has had multiple consequences like loss of forest cover and extinction of species. However, an alarming indicator is the rise of new diseases which have entered human kingdom in the last few decades. The COVID-19 pandemic is a classic example. We have here with us today two eminent scientists who will help us unravel the concept of One Health and also to help us learn the connection between human health, ecosystems and biodiversity. So without wasting any more time, let's go over to the studio. I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Mohan Gupte and Dr. Aparna Watwe to this discussion. I'll introduce our first guest, Dr. Mohan Gupte. Dr. Mohan Gupte initiated and established the National Institute of Epidemiology and the Indian Council of Medical Research School of Public Health in India in 1999. With these, he started the movement of applied epidemiological training in India, focusing on empowerment of middle-level public health officers. Professor Mohan Gupte was a World Health Organization epidemiologist in the smallpox eradication campaign in India. He is an acknowledged global expert in leprosy and has been a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement International Gandhi Award. Welcome, Dr. Gupte. Our second guest is Dr. Aparna Watwe. Dr. Watwe is an ecologist renowned for her work on lateritic plateaus, especially in the northern western ghats of Maharashtra. Her interests lie in interactions between society and ecology and community conservation. She has been a professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences till 2017. Dr. Aparna co-founded the Biome Conservation Foundation, an NGO involved in scientific action research, citizens' science programs, and community-based conservation initiatives. She has served as a member of the High-Level Monitoring Committee of Mahabaleshwar Panchagani Eco-Sensitive Area and is currently a member of the Plant Expert Committee of the Maharashtra State Biodiversity Board. So I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Aparna Bhatwe with us. So uh, Dr. Aparna, I would like to address the first question to you. Can you explain to our audience in simple terms what is biodiversity and what are ecosystems? Biodiversity very simply in like one line is everything that is living on Earth. Uh, in more complex terms, in scientific terms, one would say that it is the variety and variability of ecosystems, species, as well as genes and their interactions and all the processes that link them. So that's a standard definition of biodiversity. Uh, what does it mean? So it means that uh, everything that we see on the earth, uh, the ecosystems such as say grasslands, forest, wetlands, these are the typical ecosystems. They are one level of diversity. In this, we find species. Uh, the number of species is taken as the mark of biodiversity very often. But species richness, as we call it, that is one part of biodiversity. And the third part, which we often uh, you know, forget, is the germplasm diversity or genes diversity. So diversity of mangoes that we eat. Uh, the kind of different kinds of rice that we eat, all that is germplasm diversity. It also includes us. So maybe in some cases we can add diversity among humans or the cultures among humans also, which are linked to the biodiversity. So that's from my side. Exactly. And how would you describe ecosystems? Ecosystem is basically, uh, the word system is very important in this. So what do we understand by system? Um, so, biological system is uh, considered 
made up of many components which are linked to each other and each has its own properties but together they have a specific property or a function. So uh, to give an example think of cycle as a man-made machine. So cycle has wheel, cycle has um, uh, you Brakes, know chain, everything. Chain. Uh, together they have a certain function that you can ride a cycle. Now think of all the components, biological components, they together make an ecosystem. So basically all the plants in it, all the animals in it, including the small ones, the large ones, uh, then the abiotic components that are the non-living components, water, soil parts, uh, many compounds, rocks, all that. So everything together, the living uh, kind of uh, you know system is the ecosystem. Okay, so ecosystem would have biodiversity as its component. Yes. Yeah, as well as physical features as its component. So rocks, water, stones, all of that which is there. It's together. Together is what is ecosystem. When we say a biodiversity has declined on the planet, what exactly are we measuring? Are we measuring the loss of species or are we measuring the loss of um, numbers of population? Uh, both. Uh, actually, there are many ways of measuring biodiversity loss or when we say what is loss. One definitely is simple game of numbers that the number of species that are naturally formed, some of them have gone extinct mm. uh, and they have gone extinct because of humans. Dinosaurs had gone extinct because of natural reasons, so we don't count them. But for example, today we have certain frog species which are not seen anymore, certain plant species which are never found anymore. So that is extinction, that is one kind of loss of species. Uh, then you have ecosystems which are shrinking. So uh, where you found forest in the past, it has been logged or it has been chopped off or burnt and the forest areas have shrunk. Um, or you have wetlands in the past, now you today see some cultivation or something else. So they have changed, but the all the components of wetland which existed naturally are gone. So that is a loss of that ecosystem and third thing is degradation which where you keep seeing you know for example you see a wetland you see a river flowing you see grasslands but it's not doing the function that it used to do in the past for example if there is pollution then some of the species uh, have disappeared some have come up too much the water quality has gone down maybe the oxygen percentage in that has gone down uh, or you see forest, but it doesn't have any plants or animals in it, which were there in the past. So all these are signs of degradation. You can see that as one of the components of loss. Yeah, for a common person, it's easy to understand the loss of tigers because there has been poaching, the forests have shrunk, so on and so forth. But it's not very easy to see the loss of an insect by anthropogenic reasons. And that, as you explained, is due to habitat loss or food loss. That's very interesting. Okay, so let me explain the concept of resilience. Resilience is where an ecosystem, some minor disturbance happens, an ecosystem kind of bounces back. Maybe sometimes insects increase too much, some insect just naturally increases, then there is a feedback loop which decreases that population. Now that is resilience, whereas ecosystem manages itself. But a breakdown happens when the ecosystem loses its potential to maintain its natural functions. So that definitely is ecosystem degradation, whether we, we can feel that, okay, somewhere or other, something is missing. It could be loss of a process or a component. Uh, Dr. Gupte, uh, a lot of our audience would be hailing from urban cities. Is, is the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems really going to affect urban people? Uh, the way urbanization is happening, people are moving from villages to cities as a normal feature as time passes. When they come to cities, the cities also grow beyond their own boundaries. And you lose most of these things. For instance, when it comes to a simple thing like scrub typhus, which occurs because of the mites and susugamoshi. But what happens is there are shrubs around the houses around urban areas and so on. Now these kinds of plantations or natural uh, phenomenon around is getting destroyed. 
when the houses are getting constructed and so on. And then some shrubs will come up. In those things, the rats will come, some other animals will come. Along with that, the mites also will come. They will enter the houses and things will start happening. The same way when it comes to simple disease like say dengue, there is water scarcity. So people start storing water. When they start storing, storing water, you can't ask them to throw away the water because water is a very precious commodity in summer in particular. And it's impossible for these people to throw away the water and say that we'll manage on our own. From where they will manage? They need water for everything. And in that stored water, clean water, you get Aedes aegypti. Now when the Aedes aegypti are there, they have the virus of dengue also along with that. And uh, the disease spreads. Funnily enough, the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are not very hungry. Once they feed on a particular human being, they are happy. They will stay there. They will not move away from that place. So I have seen the epidemics which are occurring in the villages, in the cities, in the suburban areas without crossing the road. On one side of the road, dengue epidemic keeps on growing. The mosquitoes never fly to the other side because they have got everything they need over there. This is very interesting indeed. And that, that keeps on happening. We have seen several of those kinds of things, particularly with dengue, particularly with chikungunya. In chikungunya, it's very, very common. The same sort of thing has been seen over there. The same mosquitoes, similar virus, and the disease occurs over there. Now, all those things, I don't know whether you'll call it biodiversity or urbanization and ch changing the entire thing, entire concept around. Mm. So, does that mean that uh, in a pristine environment where there was a jungle around, these mosquitoes, the population of these mosquitoes would have been definitely lower? than you find in urban conglomerations? I won't say that, because mosquitoes will be there. Yeah. In fact, mosquitoes came much before us. And they have been there and they will remain there even if we go away. So that doesn't uh, bother them. And the mosquitoes have got their own habitat. For instance, a disease like say yellow fever. Fortunately, we don't have yellow fever. But we have some other diseases which mimic yellow fever kind of transmission capacity, like the Kastnur forest disease in Karnataka, which is now spreading in different parts of the country. Now what happens was, in the tree canopies, there are a particular variety of mosquitoes. When you fill the trees, the monkeys will be lost. The mosquitoes don't have the habitat over there. They will start coming down. And they will affect people. That's how yellow fever was transmitting in Africa, in uh, South America, and it went on spreading like that. In Panama, when the Panama Canal was being built up, mm -hmm. malaria came up, yellow fever came up, all these kinds of things happened. Mm -hmm. Because of this human affection, the Anthropocene that you are referring to, mm -hmm. that's how it all affected. And the disease kept on coming. That's what happens. Now the so-called pristine environment, if you keep it that way, then the balance is kept. Okay. Once you break that balance, then, whether it is insects, whether it is animals, they will start moving around. Mm -hmm. We get leopard coming in the cities now. And we see them going and uh, even, at times, even tigers. Mm -hmm. And they will be attacking men, people. Mm -hmm. Now, why that happens? That happens because we are invading their homes, mm -hmm. their areas, natural habitat, and we suffer for it. So, Dr. Aparna, I had a question and uh, the point which Dr. Gupte just made is there is a balance in natural ecosystem. So, can you explain in easy terms what would be a balance of, e of species in an ecosystem would be? So, I think uh, a good way to explain balance is uh, talking of feedback. Okay, feedback are regulatory measures. So, uh, when Sir was talking, I was thinking about uh, the uh, issue of pigeons in our city. So, uh, many of the cities here have pigeons. Now, where are the pigeons from? So, originally the pigeons are from a uh, rocky uh, cliff kind of ecosystem and they breed there and uh, they have their natural cycles there. Now, when city is created, 
we have created artificial cliffs everywhere. So there is a concept called urban cliff hypothesis that we have now artificial cliffs which the pigeons find very suitable for breeding and they have moved to uh, cities and are breeding there. In the natural ecosystem, if the pigeons had bred unchecked, uh, that won't happen. Okay, so in a natural ecosystem, there would be predators which would attack mm. them. There could be owls, there could be raptors which come in and automatically, naturally, the uh, population of pigeons will be kept in balance. Mm. So, there is a limit to which any animal can expand because something is there to eat it up mm. or, you know, the uh, population kind of uh, remains in an equilibrium. Now, that's not happening here. In city, we have kites, but they are not attacking pigeons. They are attacking, what are they eating? They are eating all the garbage. Because they have ample food, why would they go chasing after a pigeon? And we have this artificial system where we are living with pigeons just next to us. There is no check on them. We can't kill them. And they are not going to, you know, stop their own populations in any manner. So it's kind of thing which is out of balance now. In the in a natural ecosystem, this would have never happened. They but in an artificial happened. ecosystem like a city, either we have to get it done, or we have to manage it, or we have to bear with whatever is going to, uh, you know, cause. How are animals from jungles connected with urban people, and how would they transmit this? Well. Uh, uh, I was thinking of talking when you were mentioning about pigeons. I was thinking of bats. And we have seen classic uh, uh, films or clips at least, mm -hmm. where bats were so shown in China in the households. When you remove the tiles, you will find plenty of bats over there. Usually bats of various sizes, various species stay together in the jungles mm. and uh, in the tree canopies, in the uh, tree, uh, what do you call, I don't know. Caves. Caves, yeah. So caves, of course, very common. Mm. And they hang over there and they stay over there. Mm. They meet each other and they harbor several viruses. Mm. That's a very, very common thing. Mm -hmm. And these viruses and all kinds of bats staying together, they meet each other mm. and they transmit viruses amongst each other. Surprisingly, the bats don't suffer because of those viruses. They are infected, they, the virus is perpetuated in them, they don't suffer because of that. When they start moving around, flying around, and they can fly miles together, when they go away, they will be passing their feces, they were passing their urine, and there are pigs below, there are some other animals below. They will get infected. Those animals will come in contact with people and through that you can get infection. A very interesting uh, example of Nipah virus mm. in Bangladesh and uh, adjacent West Bengal uh, area, Darjeeling or adjacent Darjeeling areas. You you will see the Tadi and Madi that we talk of. Mm -hmm. There are small trees and you uh, attach some cups over there by uh, making some uh, some uh, incision. some incisions on the tree barks and put those barks out there so that you uh, uh, collect the syrup mm. from that and the syrup that you get bats also like it mm -hmm. so the bats come over there sit on the cup drink that syrup pass their urine oh. and you and me unknowingly will take that tadi or madi drink it we get nipah virus we suffer because of that okay. Common thing if you ask for is rabies, for instance. Mm. Rabies will be there in the animals in the forest areas. Mm. Now, domestic uh, dogs mm. would come in contact with those animals. Mm. And because of the bites, because of staying together, they will suffer. They in turn will, uh, uh, will bite human beings mm. and rabies will be transmitted. Most of the times you will find that human beings are going to be dead ends as far as the virus is concerned. Mm. Now viruses and these animal, these uh, microbes, mm. we like to survive. So they won't like to end up in human beings. They like to perpetuate. So they are happy with bats. Mm. They are happy with pigs, as, as it happens in Japanese encephalitis, or in birds, mm. as it happens with uh, 
bird uh, bird flu bird flu yeah no they will stay over there they will perpetuate if they come to man from man to man transmission if it occurs it's okay they will survive mm-hmm. if that is not there they are going to die and that kind of thing no living organism or species will like to have mm-hmm. so that's it what you are talking about balance this will also come in that so that's a very interesting example which you just gave us and that also leads us into the second part of our discussion uh, the discussion about which you are a, a very strong promoter of and you are also a leading expert on that can you explain the concept of one health to us i will start perhaps from charak samhita charak samhita okay in charak samhita there is a concept which is uh, mentioned over there of loka and purusha mm-hmm. now loka means universe loka means everything around not only our earth mm-hmm. it goes even beyond that and purusha is all living beings what you are talking about the ecosystem biotic and abiotic purusha and loka are reflections of each other okay what purusha is having is what is there in loka in the universe the principles which are there are also present in the human beings are also present in animals in uh, birds in trees in the shrubs around they are all reflections of each other now this is not philosophical this is something that is documented is well known and if something goes wrong with the ecosystem with the nature we also get affected the animals will get affected now that's what charaka has believed charaka is documented mm. now this is the way we start looking at it okay if we look at say a tribal population now tribes as i was mentioning a few minutes back you will see that these people will move to the forest they are collectors mm. they are not cutting things mm. if they pick up some things there will be dried wood to burn the living wood they will not cut usually except for construction of the houses or a very limited thing but otherwise it's dead wood they will take and burn it and use it for cooking and whatever other purposes so that's the way it goes the animals will live with them as their own uh, family members that's why it has been going on in tribal population also now as things changed they have to depend because the forests were being cut animals were being lost so they have to go deeper inside inside the forest and they will pick up the diseases they will pick up the viruses that's how the marburg virus came up that's how ebola came up and things have started happening that way now this is what it means by what you are asking just now one health so no, the- when it comes to one health we go much beyond that because we are thinking of uh, right that uh, we depend on each other as has been uh, said by charaka but this concept of one health actually came up from one medicine uh, there was a german uh, there was a person who was working from usa actually he worked in africa also he worked in germany as well uh, calvin schwab is the name of the person he started thinking of one medicine first of all one medicine which is same medicine for human beings as well as animals and then came the concept of public health for veterinary mm-hmm. now veterinary sciences when they started talking of public health they did not think only of animals they thought of human beings first when you treat the animals you are protecting the human beings in the process mm-hmm. that's how it started and then the days came when we started having the epidemics when the epidemics came we knew that how the epidemics are coming up devastation of forests Uh, people going around the communication system going around and uh, people start meeting each other the messages start going around so we wanted to control everything now controlling everything is something beyond the system of ecosystem or beyond one health we have to we have to learn to live together as you talk of the urai for instance we mentioned a few minutes back now in the urai what happens you get everything living together whether these are bad woods whether there are animals which are causing some harm to others 
but each one respects each other mm. and whatever balance they want to keep they keep amongst themselves still because they know how to grow to what extent they will grow now that's what if we learn then the purpose of one health is served so in one health we start looking at man we look at animals we look or look at the natural systems around the uh, trees and shrubs and everything and as you are saying of abiotic system also we think of abiotic system as well mm. the rivers riverines the uh, uh, mountains rocks all yeah. those things will come yeah. uh, this is started coming up mm. particularly the avian flu h5n1 mm. and at the same time ebola was also around 2004 that was the time when we started talking of public health emergencies of international concern mm. that's what who defines feek or public health emergencies of international concern now when a feek is declared the effects are really very bad in a country the country has to declare it as a disaster international regulations come up flights start, start they stop around nobody can go over there people's movements are stopped the whole economic system comes to a standstill as we have seen with covid 19 so nobody wants to have that situation of peak public health emergency and who was very keen about it so in 2004 when these kinds of things started happening rockefeller foundation came up together and there was a meeting in usa involving who unicef fao oi and all these people came together international agencies experts in various fields and this is called as manhattan principle and a declaration came up in 2004 in which everybody realized that one health is important the term one health one world one health emerged out of that manhattan meeting in 2004 5 and that's how it started coming up before that we used to talk of one medicine was the last thing to jump from one medicine to one health was this the occurrence of epidemics the occurrence of ebola occurrence of h5n1 bird flu and so on there is a tripartite agreement with who fao and oi animal health organization they came together and they started working together in this there are three four different meetings annually they uh, keep on meeting india is part of the uh, system also they have identified some three four different areas one was uh, antimicrobial resistance rabies is one more bird flu is one more so these are three different areas which are identified and they keep on working on those three areas but as a as i mentioned one health has to go beyond these epidemic diseases one health has to go beyond these uh, diseases which occur as uh, epidemics and leading to fake and so on we are now thinking in terms of going beyond these uh, systems and think of even uh, developmental origin of disease and health do hard what we talk of do hard we what we talk of we have been thinking of diabetes and uh, one health mm. as component of that we think of cardiovascular diseases and all those things are put together <coughs> in uh, again coming to northeast in some other areas also hypertension is very common in assam in particular for instance why it happens as people go over there they drink, drink tea and in that tree in the in the tree in the tea they add salt mm-hmm. so over consumption of salt is responsible for hypertension to a certain extent so that happens now all those kinds of things which are changing behavior changing habitat people get concerned about that all those things will have to be part of the one health component so but overall sir when you were telling about one health i was uh, thinking that um uh, it's basically what we have been saying about ecosystem health totally we are not looking at a specific disease and correcting it but we are looking at prevention more how do we understand the origin of a disease and how do we prevent it before it becomes a calamity for the entire world i think that's one thing that we have learned that's what people will like to go for today if you ask me one health concept is uh, is totally looking into these fake situations emerging and researching diseases mm. that's our focus okay. as it happened today for instance in covid 
from china we got the genome of sars cov2 now once that sars cov2 genome was available people started working on vir- in on vaccines and you you know it that less than a year we had four five different types of vaccines available how it became how it became available only because we talked to each other we started working with each other and we developed that we went beyond developing these things to clinical trials pre clinical studies clinical trials and then we decided to bridge several things like phase 1 was completed phase 2 3 were bridged together and what used to take about 10 12 years we were able to do it in less than one year now so uh, dr gupte and dr watway the in, the conversation is very interesting and it reminds me of the gaia hypothesis wherein uh, it is proposed that the entire planet is one living organism right the interactions which happen within all the living organisms and the abiotic elements make the planet bestow upon everyone its life sustaining capacity and therefore it acts as one organism so i think let us stop with this note and thank you so much for bringing up the topic of ecosystem health and biodiversity and the topic of one health as well as zoonotic diseases for our audience and i'm sure our audience would have enjoyed this interesting conversation and we look forward to one more session from you in the near future as we come to the end of this interesting conversation i would like to take this opportunity to thank dr mohan gupte and dr aparna watwe Dr Gupte thank you so much for spending time with us and Dr Watwe thank you for sharing your views on this interesting subject Dr Gurudas Nulkar you gave us a very good opportunity and the interaction with two of you was most rewarding because it's rarely possible to come in contact with people who are away from our own fields and interact with them understand what's going on and increase our own fears and go beyond that so we have to do that in one way we'll do that Thank you very much. Thank you so much.